Welcome to today's webinar, Microtransit versus Micromobility Series, Webinar 3, Planning. Good afternoon. Today, we like to let you know how you can participate in the webinar. You may participate in the chat, you may chat with everyone or with other hosts and panelists. You may ask questions by using the Q&A to ask any questions you may have in your reactions below in the reactions tab to share your reactions. The agenda today, we'll have an introduction of the TA centers first. So the Federal Transit Administration's Technical Assistance Network exists to promote mobility for all Americans through the provision and coordination of transportation services. Through the Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility, or CCAM, technical assistance partnerships provide a range of services and resources to allow stakeholders at all levels to build capacity, provide training through webinars and workshops, and to do research. The technical assistance centers featured today are the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, the National Center for Mobility Management, the National Rural Transit Assistance Program, and the Shared Use Mobility Center. Furthermore, the Transportation and Technical Assistance Coordination Library exists to provide FTA or the Federal Transit Administration and its six technical assistance centers a shared platform to provide transportation coordination resources from a diverse range of um, sources. TACO is funded by FTA and includes information from all the TA centers, including others not featured today, such as the NCAT, which is the National Center for Applied Transit Technology, and the Transit Workforce Center. We will begin with a presentation by the Shared Use Mobility Center with Al Benedict and Hani Shimat. Uh, thank you, Anjali and, and Nelly. Uh, we're, we're really excited to be here. My name is Al Benedict. Uh, I'm the uh, with the Shared Use Mobility Center and joined with Hani. Uh, we're going to co-present today. Uh, let me advance the slide here. <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, so the first you know just to kind of the the first webinar we we talked about microtransit and this this webinar we're uh, the second web webinar we talked about micromobility and today we're going to talk about some of the common planning and implementation considerations that cut across both modes. Uh, um, uh, we just have a handful of slides and that we really want to hear from um, the practitioners on the ground uh, working on this on these as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hanny um, and then he's going to. Um, uh, you know, give it give it back to me toward the end. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Um, so yes, for those of you who are not familiar with us, so we'll Oops. go back here. Uh, we're the uh, Shared Use Mobility Center, um, and we are a nonprofit organization working in the public interest to uh, replace car centric transportation with people focused shared mobility to fight climate change, uh, promote equity and uh, universal access, and to strengthen community. Um, and we have offices in uh, Chicago and Los Angeles, but we work with uh, transit agencies, local governments, uh, you know, mobility providers uh, all over the country. Um, so when we're talking about how microtransit and micromobility relate, 
it's really just about how they fit in with the overall uh, transportation networks. Um, and it's about integration. So of course, that's very context specific. Um, you know, in, in denser areas or areas with good bike infrastructure, for example, I have first last mile solutions here. Um, bike share and scooter share micro mobility um, can be really great at being for at, at getting people to um, you know other other transit services potentially fixed route services um, that don't have easily accessible feeder routes or reliable feeder routes and then in the same way um, micro mobility or micro transit I'm sorry in less dense more rural areas might also fulfill the same purpose um, you know I'm thinking about a, uh, a particular agency that that pursued a micro transit program, kind of thinking about it as the first last five mile problem instead of first last mile. Um, but then of course, you know, in other contexts, they can be, uh, a micro transit can be a service in its own right and help people access locations, just generally not reachable um, by available fixed route services. Um, so the real question is, you know, understanding that these are very context specific, how can microtransit or micromobility integrate in your community? And um, really to understand that, um, you need to engage with your community and do a needs assessment. Um, so if you don't know the mobility needs of your community, it's really difficult to uh, plan and implement meaningful mobility solutions. Um, and that community should guide those solutions. So talk to your riders and talk to your drivers and, um, and this image right here actually is the uh, is from an initiative, uh, the Center for Pan Asian Community Services, um, and it's from some community engagement efforts that uh, SUMC helped help them with in a suburb of Atlanta uh, in their efforts to develop a microtransit program. And we worked with them. We were lead technical consultants um, on this project, and you know we really helped meet people on their terms. Uh, and and do surveys and interviews to really understand people's mobility needs and really understand how to improve uh, the system. Um, I also want to bring up uh, another program of ours, the Shared Mobility Center um, works on the Clean Mobility Options Program, which is a California specific um, a California specific program working in disadvantaged communities that don't meet uh, California air quality standards, and uh, working with community groups themselves to build mobility solutions uh, tailored to them. And part of that is um, helping them with community needs assessments prior to um, prior to implementing the mobility service. Um, so there are a lot of good resources on uh, the Clean Mobility Options program on their website, which is uh, cleanmobilityoptions.org. Um, so then I'm also going to briefly talk about um, considerations for procurement. You know, once and, and these are very broad, and like I said, it's very context specific. So you have to, you know, so these are very general considerations. But um, even after all that, it's it's a knowledge gaining opportunity. So consult with peer cities, interview service vendors. You know, potentially an RFI can be useful for you know to figure out how uh, new technology and, and new mobility options can integrate in your community. Um, I have these two. Uh, data sharing and privacy considerations points here because both micromobility and microtransit generally we think of as uh, being tech enabled. Um, so it's important to, to maintain that, maintain the privacy, you know, consider the privacy and uh, data sharing uh, needs of the system. And also important to um, make sure you have accessible options that can accommodate all users. Uh, for example, wheelchair accessible vehicles in a microtransit service or adaptive micromobility. Um, and then, yeah, develop the RFP around that need and, and solicit innovative solutions. Um, so this last point is open data solutions, which um, leads into Al's part of the presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to him. Uh, thank you, Annie. Oops, uh, two slides. Well, I need to go back one. Um, you know, we, again, we just, we do want to just touch on this. Um, I think uh, I'm going to move it, Hanny. <laughs> there, there we go. We're both hitting the the advance. Um, so one of an important consideration when when planning um, 
you know, uh, mobility service, either microtransit or micromobility, is in, in really thinking about this at the time of, of procuring the service or you know, during the, the, the needs assessment is how data standards, uh, open data solutions can really help in the planning uh, and implementation of that. Uh, you know, from both a uh, operational perspective, but then to to help coordinate services and and make the data available as a, as an agency to understand how users are are using it and how the service is is um, uh, um, being being operated on the ground. But then also from the rider's perspective, in terms of uh, being able to discover the services and use the services more more easily. And so this is really something to kind of consider uh, when you know, when procuring the service. And uh, there's lots of great resources out there on open data solutions and, and uh, you know, we'd have, be happy to talk further, but again, just kind of a high level, uh, just to, as a consideration to, to look at. I think the, the diagram on the right kind of offers a, this, this particular diagram offers, uh, it's for the transactional data specification, but I think it's it's applicable, applicable across Across standards that that you might use uh, in your in your uh, mobility solutions, uh, for example, the the top diagram shows how each system kind of needs to to have a special instance to communicate with each other. Whereas using a common language, uh, data language, uh, the bottom shows how this communication can cross you know cut across the different different operators and in different modes and more sophisticated applications to, to make a more seamless and, and integrated experience for both on the operation side and, and on the user side. And, you know, again, just a high level that this is something to, to, to keep in mind and, and how to, to, to manage these, uh, manage these mobility options in your community. And uh, we just have a couple more slides. Uh, the conclusion, and again, we we wanted to just high level. Uh, really, just wanted to give an overview of these two and some of the the planning considerations, and then, well, you know, save time for our sort of on the ground uh, experiences uh, from from the other panelists. But you know, as Hanny mentioned, uh, micro both micro transit and micro mobility can serve, you know, multiple options. They're really context specific. Uh, you know, first last mile is is often a common use for these these modes, um, but but it's really based on sort of the understanding the needs of your community, the mobility needs of your community, and then planning accordingly. Uh, you know, and the benefits can be you know from reduce single occupancy vehicle trips, which in turn can help reduce the your car, your, your city's carbon footprint. Uh, both of them promote more uh, can promote a more active lifestyle. Uh, and and it's and and the you know the technology of both can create that that on demand service uh, you know, which which is which which can you know which which really has the potential for a higher quality service that that can can you know can can help to to save money but uh, in some instances where uh, for example you know if you use microtransit service uh, in in uh, Combination with your paratransit service, uh, the microtransit service, or, or TNCs, and in, in as well can help dispatch vehicles that are sort of uh, that meet the needs of the rider. And so, um, it maybe maybe not all all instances require a wheelchair accessible vehicle, and in those cases, a, a smaller vehicle can be dispatched. Uh, but but making sure that there's there's plenty of, of wheelchair accessible vehicles to to meet the demand of the community. Um, so that's really our our slides. We just have a couple more. I just wanted to uh, point out, you know, we have the, the Mobility Learning Center, uh, learn.sharedusemobilitycenter.org, and we have a lot of great resources on there. Uh, a recent one that we collaborated with uh, NCMM, NCMM and uh, NADTC, and that's a, a, a learning module on university mobility. Uh, I think it's great and, uh, you know, encourage everyone to, to check that out. Uh, and uh, just a, a quick plug in terms of the, we have our Share Mobility Summit coming up and uh, we uh, May 2nd through 4th in Chicago and, and uh, we'll be talking about these issues and, and, and others, we'd, you know, we'd love to see everyone there. And yeah. I'll turn it over to, to Anjali. Before we move on, we'd like to apologize and introduce Al and Hani. So Albert Benedict is the Director for Learning for Learning Center and Accessibility Programs at SMC, where he is responsible for managing several national projects to evaluate opportunities and economic and environmental benefits related to shared mobility 
an integrated transportation system. So he really knows what he's talking about. And Hani Shamat is the program coordinator for SEMSI, and he works on various projects, primarily with the Mobility Innovation Coll Collaborative team, where he helps to provide technical assistance to transit agencies around the country. He works on transportation on innovative transportation pilot projects and shared lessons learned. And he's particularly interested in micromobility and exploring how it interacts and integrates with wider transportation networks. So thank you both so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Again, um, and thank you for, for, you know, for hosting these sessions. I think they're great. All right. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. I'm going to introduce us, Ken Thompson from uh, National Aging Disability Transportation Center, but I'm really happy to uh, introduce Tim Geibel, who's the executive director of the Crawford Area Transportation Authority. Tim has 20 years experience in transit, and he has uh, worked with CAD on a number of projects, uh, uh, expansion, facility construction, all kinds of interesting things. And he has been recognized by FTA as a recipient, recipient of the FTA Administrator's Award for Outstanding Public Service. And as um, part of Cotter's um, strategic planning process, Tim has overseen the creation of the Northwest Pennsylvania Mobility Alliance, which you're gonna hear more about, um, to advance innovative mobility projects in Northwest Pennsylvania. And uh, so, you know, part of that um, project also is the establishment of the first rural bike share program in Pennsylvania. So we want to welcome Tim um, and uh, happy to uh, uh, have you on board here. Okay, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Uh, again, Tim Geibel with uh, CADA and the Northwest Pennsylvania Mobility Alliance. A little bit of information about you know who we are. CADA is a uh, rural Public Transportation Authority. We are a multi-county authority. We provide services over 1,700 square miles in Northwest Pennsylvania, just south of Erie County. We have a fleet of 65 vehicles and 93 men and women that uh, serve our organization on a daily basis. Our total operating budget, about $6.1 million. We provide fixed route services in our city hubs and uh, ADA paratransit service. Plus we also have countywide door-to-door services that are funded in part by the Pennsylvania Lottery. The Northwest Pennsylvania Mobility Alliance, it is a 501c3 organization that was formed by CATA back in 2019. It's structured as a component unit of our authority, which means that the five member board of directors of CATA are automatically board members of the nonprofit with the addition of four potential community board members for a maximum of uh, nine board members. We, uh, as of right now, we have uh, six board members for the nonprofit, but we really wanted to form this nonprofit so that we could have local control to uh, move innovative projects on a very small scale, to try and access funding that may not be available to a municipal authority, but could be available to a 501c through uh, bank donations, uh, local grants and funding sources. Plus we also use our nonprofit to put on educational events. So if you've ever heard of the transit retreat concept, we facilitated two national retreats over the past two years. And I would love to see you at a future transit retreat. So uh, part of CATA strategic business plan, we updated this in 2022. And what we wanted to do was really redefine mobility and redefine what that meant for our communities. We wanted to be more than a fixed route and a paratransit provider. Uh, you know, we knew that if we were going to survive in a competitive environment in a more active lifestyle community that we need to find ways to do more than just fixed route and paratransit services, we really wanted to find ways that we could integrate mobility into the economic development of our rural communities, plus add vibrancy to our, to our towns. And the Mobility Alliance is one of the primary drivers of some of the stuff that we're doing and what I wanna talk about today. Uh, 
Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the city of Meadville. This is where I'm based. This is our base of operations. I should have mentioned CATA. We have four different facilities in two different counties uh, between Crawford and Venango County, but our base of operation is here in the city of Meadville. Uh, Meadville is a population of just under 13,000. Uh, we do have Allegheny College, which is a liberal arts school with about a 1,400 student population. We also have French Creek, which is a huge recreational draw in Northwest Pennsylvania. French Creek starts south of Buffalo, New York, uh, runs through Erie County, comes through our service areas in Crawford and, and Venango counties, and it is a huge recreational draw for canoeing, kayaking, fishing. Uh, it's, it's recognized as one of the most ecologically significant waterways east of the Mississippi River with over 66 species of fish, 27 species of mussels, and a very thriving bald eagle population along French Creek. So thousands of people kayak uh, French Creek over the summer months. They're passing straight through the city of Meadville. And that's one of the things that we wanted to try and connect to from a mobility standpoint that we'll talk about. And also in Meadville, we have Ernst Trail, which is a five mile one way paved bike trail that, that complements, uh, it runs alongside a part, a part of French Creek. So we thought with our Mobility Alliance, this would be the perfect location to try and test a, a community bike share program that we wanted to get off the ground. So we started this process in 2019 and we wanted to survey the community about what, how, how this community would respond to a bike share program. Having the recreational draws of French Creek, of Ernst Trail, the college campus in town, and just the, just the, the layout of Meadville, we thought this would be an excellent location to test bike share. So uh, we, had, we had what we thought was a relatively good response rate uh, to our surveys. And it was interesting that what we found is that people indicated that they, would, they wanted to use a bike share program more for recreation and exercise. You know, we think about first mile, last mile, and uh, individuals using, you know, bike share to complement transit and get to and from work. And we did see some of that in the surveys, but the overwhelming majority wanted to use this as a, an active lifestyle uh, uh, perspective. So that really told us that we had something here. We had something that could add value to Meadville, could help enhance active lifestyles and add vibrancy to the downtown, which is all part of our strategic plan. So when we looked a little further at the surveys, 76% of the people that took the surveys either live or work in Meadville. And the vast majority of the people using the surveys indicated they were not college students. So we were really attracting people to the survey uh, you know, that, that, were, that were a new demographic for us. If you look at the age ranges, you know, over 60% uh, between the ages of 30 and 60, over 43% over the, with the household income of over $50,000. What this tells us is that this, this is not the transit, typical rural transit rider demographic. So this bike share program, if we were to get it up and running, could actually become more of a branding mechanism, not only add vibrancy to downtown, help improve active lifestyles, but a branding mechanism to get people into the mobility ecosystem of CATA. Again, we're trying to be more than just a fixed route and a paratransit provider. So this could bring people into our brand and hopefully attract future transit riders. So as we went throughout the community trying to talk about bike share and drum up support, you know, we, we framed this as a community asset. Uh, something that needs to be funded locally, it needs full funding. You can't generate costs and, and revenues renting bikes at $2.50, $3 an hour to sustain a program. But if we really wanted to make this work for, for the city of Meadville, we need to have full funding through local partnerships. And you know, I was very pleased with uh, the amount of support that we got from, from various uh, you know, banks and foundations. And when people were asking us, you know, how, how is this going to work? You know, what's, you know, what, what are you going to do to make sure this is a successful program? We really didn't have that many um, examples that we could share because we really couldn't find many uh, functioning, operational, uh, rural bike share programs in communities of our size. So, you know, we were really kind of going out on a limb with our sponsors and our local partners to, to invest in this initiative. So what we ended up doing is that uh, we researched providers that would support rural bike share, and uh, there weren't all that many that we could find. 
Uh, we've, we located a company named Colony. Uh, we just started year three with Colony. It's been a, a fantastic uh, partnership with Colony for our bike share program. But from, a, from, from our perspective and a very high level, you know, there's, there's really two types of bike share systems. You've got a dock based where a bike is physically locked into some form of infrastructure, some type of um, a docking station, or you have a freestanding system that uses a rear tire locking mechanism that could, could be much more flexible and doesn't need the, the infrastructure of a full dock station uh, program. And we thought just based on cost and trying to really test the concept of bike share, that operating a dockless system would be the, the way to go for Meadville. So we started bike share um, back in 2021 and we've completed 1300 transactions since the, the beginning of the program. And I really kind of framed this as a grassroots effort. You know, we received funding from uh, two local banks, the medical center here in town, a, another business, a local foundation, and we partnered with our convention and visitors bureau to help us with all of our branding and uh, uh, ad creation. But what we, we started with 20 bikes, they were all used bikes that we found from a, uh, a defunct uh, bike share system in a, in, a more, in, a, in a larger urban area. And we really wanted to put this out on the ground with minimal investments, but we wanted to be able to really test the concept. So what you see here in the, uh, the top picture on the right, this is our bike station at Ernst Trail, the paved trailhead. And, uh, you know, what, what I see here is not a very professional presentation of bike share. It's, a gra it's, it's gravel. It's a $90 bike rack from Amazon. And if you see up in the corner, the, uh, the little sign we have here, that's a fixed route bus stop sign that we just put a new sticker on. So, you know, we really did this as, as, as uh, I don't wanna say low budget, but as low budget as possible. So, because we really didn't want to leverage the goodwill with our sponsors and with these major investments, if we didn't think this program was gonna work. So we started on, on really a shoestring budget. So year two came and uh, we, we added about 10% of transactions than we did in uh, year one. And what you see now here, this is the same, uh, the same station at Ernst Trail. But now that we knew that we had something here, we didn't lose bikes and that we, this program was gonna be supported by the community. We wanted to start making more permanent uh, you know, stations for the bikes. So we partnered with the Ernst Trail group. Uh, we put down some nice concrete uh, we bought some new bikes. They're, these new bikes are actually belt drive bikes. They're very low maintenance bikes. They work much better for the application that we're, that we're working on. And we now have a paved staging area for these bikes at Ernst Trail. And we, and we also started adding new locations at Allegheny College, uh, some of the community spaces in Meadville, and uh, had a really, really successful year too. Uh, year three technically started yesterday. Uh, we deployed 12 of our, of our bikes. We now have 40 bikes in our fleet. We deployed 12 of them yesterday. And what we're really trying to do now, is, now that we've got two years under our belts, we've, we've seen that this could be successful. We want to really start aligning bike share with community development. Uh, we wanna start building out bus shelters that have space to put bikes in Meadville and look at other locations in our service area, whether it be Titusville, City of Titusville, uh, Franklin or Oil City. And there's three specific projects that I wanna touch briefly on here uh, in relation to, and to bike share and micro mobility. First is the Bessemer Street Corridor. And um, on the right side of this uh, aerial picture here is the City of Meadville. Right in the middle is a four lane highway to the left of that, you have French Creek, uh, Bicentennial Park, Voodoo Microbrewery, and this corridor here to the left in between the creek and the four lane is a high development economic development corridor in the Meadville area. So the Economic Progress Alliance of Crawford County has generated millions of dollars between state funds and local funds to, to add economic development projects in this corridor. Just this spring, they'll be a breaking ground on putting a one mile uh, paved crushed gravel um, walking bike path here along the creek 
to complement Bicentennial Park and the access to uh, French Creek. So what we wanted to do, and, and we were successful in 2019, we applied to the state for uh, uh, Commonwealth Financing Authority funding to, to bookend this corridor with a bus shelter and bike pad at Bicentennial Park and a bus shelter and bike pad up here close to the Progress Alliance facility. And what we really wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that we are in the early stages of this economic development project and be able to uh, be fully engaged with, with our community. Uh, the next initiative is our Lake Wilhelm bike share program. Uh, we've been working on this for over a year now. We've been uh, working with the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to put bikes at the uh, uh, trailhead at the state park, which is about 25 miles south of our, of our office here in Meadville. It's actually in the uh, county of um, Mercer County, which is outside of our transit uh, footprint, but part of the Mobility Alliance in Northwest Pennsylvania, you know, we, you know, we were able to uh, negotiate with DCNR and it really took a long time to get to the point because there was, there was no example that DCNR had of an agreement to operate bike share in a state park. So what we ended on was a, a concessions agreement where we are, be, well, we are gonna be granted space at the trailhead to put one station with five to eight bikes and uh, operate bike share. We're um, actually, actually this coming Monday, my board will be meeting and hopefully approving the concession agreement, which will pave the way for us to launch this bike share program. And uh, Memorial, by, by Memorial Day weekend, that's our goal, uh, July 1st at the absolute latest. But what this will do, working with Colony, is that we will now have a regional bike share program where one app can be used to rent bikes at the trailhead at Lake Wilhelm or in Meadville or anywhere else that we're gonna be hopefully placing bikes. And finally, the city, the city of Titusville. This is in Crawford County. It's about 27 miles from Meadville. We, we current, it has a, about 5,200 population. It is a declining population in the community. The entire city is about three square miles. And we currently operate a one fixed route bus that kind of does a figure eight through about 75% of Titusville. We also have paratransit services in Titusville but we do not provide any fixed route services in the Southern portion of Titusville. And also two miles South of Titusville is Drake Well Museum and Oil Creek State Park, which is a fabulous recreational draw in the area. We currently have no service there. So what we're looking to do, and again, Monday at my board meeting, we're actually gonna be uh, hopefully getting approval to award a contract to a software vendor to uh, replace the fixed route with microtransit. And we're, our goal is to launch microtransit by July 1st. And what this is gonna end up doing is allowing us to expand service to the south portion of Titusville, expand service down to Drake Well, and also expand service to the trailhead of Oil Creek State Park. Because the Oil Creek State Park has an 11 mile bike trail that follows Oil Creek the whole way down to Oil City, which ties directly into our hub in Oil City. So our plans are for Titusville to implement microtransit is to also implement bike share. We are currently applying for county funds to help us with the acquisition of bikes so that we can put bikes in Titusville because there is a paved trail called the Queen City Trail that runs from Titusville and connects into Drake Wells. So, you know, with, with all these projects coming together, we'll be able to tie transit through microtransit, bike share into the city of Titusville, which feeds directly into the state park and give someone the opportunity if they wanted to, to travel the whole way from Titusville to Oil City, you know, by bike. And then once you're in Oil City, you can access transit systems and that connects uh, most of Venango County. So, you know, we have a number of, uh, you know, really, really good initiatives that are, that we're trying to move forward. And we've taken the stance of wanting to do this through our non, do as much as we can through our nonprofit to really help leverage uh, local funding to advance local priorities. So we've, we've had excellent partnerships. And now that we're in starting year three of our bike share program, and we're in year three of our mobility alliance, you know, we're really, opening the doors to be able to attract 
new funding opportunities and new partnerships to, to expand our services. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ken and I look forward to the Q&A. All right, I had to find my mouse. Um, I guess, uh, I guess Anjale, you're gonna uh, introduce our next speaker or I could do it quickly, but um, I think you have the bio, but um, um, yes. I, uh, Thank you, Ken. Our next speaker is Roberto Partida. He is a transportation planner. Oh, excuse me. He's a transportation planner with the city of Lincoln, Nebraska. He works for Lincoln, Nebraska Transportation and Utilities in the Traffic Engineering Department. He has a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Minnesota, where his studies focused on community development and transportation planning. In his current role, he is focused on multimodal transportation planning efforts and overseeing the city's shared micromobility programs. Some of his primary duties include implementation of the Lincoln Bike Plan, overseeing Lincoln bike, Lincoln's Bike Share Program and East Vernon Program, educational efforts around bicycle and pedestrian safety, and advocating for multimodal projects that promote safe, connected, and accessible infrastructure for vulnerable road users. Go ahead, Roberto. Thank you. Checking and I have control. Oh, it's a little lag on the slides. Apologies. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. So um, today, I kind of want to give just a brief overview of what active transportation and and the public transit landscape looks like for the city of Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, from there, we'll touch on some of the micro transit here in Lincoln, as well as the micro mobility, and then really, really looking just more broadly at what we're planning to do with existing planning documents or future plans, um, and how that will be integrated. So to start off, um, from an active transportation standpoint here in the city of Lincoln, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a robust trail network um, and currently working on supplementing that with accessible, connected, and safe on-street uh, bike facilities. Um, and that's coming through the implementation of the Lincoln Bike Plan. Um, some noteworthy items here. Uh, we have... 1.3 miles of separated bike lanes. That's our N Street cycle track. It's actually uh, the only protected cycle track here in the state of Nebraska. Um, and we recently also implemented Nebraska's first uh, bicycle boulevard, um, which was super exciting. From the public transit perspective, uh, we have StarTran. And with StarTran, um, we have 14 fixed routes and three additional fixed routes that's specifically uh, servicing the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, UNL. Um, from a ridership perspective, uh, the numbers are there. I don't need to read them all, but um, the last fiscal year, we had a little over 2 million riders, um, which we're seeing an uptick back after um, the the more intense pieces of the pandemic. I also wanna note that the overall mission of StarTran is to provide safe, convenient, reliable, and accessible transit service um, for all community members and visitors uh, to the city of Lincoln. From a micro transit perspective, um, StarTran does have a door-to-door -door transportation service um, or paratransit service um, that was specifically created to help the transportation needs of individuals who experience disabilities um, and who are unable to ride the regular, regular fixed route city buses. Um, paratransit for us, it's door-to-door it's -door service um, and it's available to all eligible individuals specifically within city limits. And you're able to schedule either on the day of or a week in advance. So there is some flexibility there. 
um, from a numbers perspective, looking at the last fiscal year um, for paratransit in particular, we had over 73,000 trips completed um, with an average trip duration of 19 minutes. Um, and each rider was riding about 100 times uh, throughout the, the fiscal year. Um, the pickup window, just for the paratransit piece, 15 minutes prior or after you schedule your trip. Um, and we have an on-demand van leak service, but paratransit takes priority to that. And I will speak to the van link uh, perspective here right now. So in addition to paratransit, StarTran has an on-demand transportation service called VanLink. Um, these vehicles tend to be smaller than regular buses or some of our other paratransit services, uh, service vehicles. Um, these provide door-to-door -door service for customers scheduling trips through uh, a smartphone app. Um, this was created um, in response to the shift in demand and capacity. Um, this new service was introduced here in the city of Lincoln back in April of 2020 um, that offered passengers premium on-demand trips within city limits. Um, it's important to note VanLink is not separate is not a separate system, but uses extra capacity on existing paratransit vehicles um, to offer that uh, curb to curb service um, for the general public. Uh, as I mentioned, the program started back in April of 2020 um, in response to the shift in demand and capacity. Um, resulting from the pandemic. Um, the last fiscal year, we saw over 8,000 rides taken utilizing VanLink. 71% um, of those were paratransit users. Um, and to date, since the inception of this program, we've had 26,594 total rides taken. Oh, and then Real quick, uh, the average number of vehicles that we have out on an average weekday um, for van link during peak times, which was around uh, 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m., we have 15 to 16 vehicles. And during non-peak times, um, we average around 14 vehicles available for folks. Transitioning over to the micromobility side of the house for the city of Lincoln. Um, as mentioned earlier, I, I oversee these two programs and um, these two programs were created really to support the city's goals of providing multimodal transportation options um, to enhance the overall mobility of city residents and visitors, as well as creating livable and connected neighborhoods and then maintaining a healthy and safe environment um, for, all, uh, for all residents and visitors here in the city of Lincoln. Um, the two programs that I oversee is our bike share program called Bike Link um, and our scooter share program uh, called Scooter Link. Um, these two shared micro mobility programs not only connect users to existing transit networks, um, but they also provide an alternative uh, to driving. Starting off with Bike Link, um, we officially launched back in April of 2018. Um, this year is actually going to mark our five year anniversary, which is super exciting. Um, this program initially started with conversations with our university here in town um, and the college students really wondering why Lincoln didn't have a bike share program and and what it would take to, to get that off the ground. Um, after conversations internally here in the city of Lincoln, uh, we pursued a congestion mitigation and air quality improvement program grant um, to help us purchase equipment to start a, a bike share program here. Um, one thing that's that's unique uh, to the city, and I know there are other municipalities across the country that operate this way, um, the 
all of the bike share equipment is actually owned by the city of Lincoln. Uh, we use a um, nonprofit, nonprofit called Rome for our operation and maintenance. Um, and yeah, on to the next. So in total, where we're at now, um, our bike share program, we have 21 docking stations. It is a fully docked system. Um, within those 21 docking stations, we have a total of 130 bikes. Um, 105 of those are traditional classic bikes. Um, and then 25 of those uh, are e-bikes or pedal assist bikes. Um, big picture overall, in, in the five years that we've been operating this program, uh, we've seen over 175,000 trips taken uh, by 15,000, a little over 15,000 unique users. Um, and to kind of help with the O&M costs, uh, we go through sponsorships. Right now we have a total of 12 equipment sponsors um, with three of those sponsoring both bikes and stations, one sponsoring a station, um, four other sponsors doing fleets of bikes. And then we have what we call a unicorn bike sponsorship, which is uh, a smaller um, business or organization sponsoring a single bike. Um, I also want to note that all of our docking stations are um, strategically placed within a two to three city block distance from a StarTran bus stop. Transitioning over to our scooter program, um, we know that historically when scooters first became a thing, um, scooter companies were just essentially showing up to the city and uh, starting to operate scooters. We in Lincoln wanted to be proactive and ensure we didn't run into those type of issues. So we um, decided to move forward with a scooter pilot program. Um, that pilot lasted for a total of 16 months. Um, scooter Link formally launched in September of 2020. During that pilot, both Bird and Spin were the two e-scooter companies that participated. Um, and I will quickly touch on kind of some of the high level observations from that pilot program. Um, I think in general, what we noticed or what we saw rather from the data, uh, this is a valid form of transportation. And the numbers show just that. Um, in that 16 month period, we saw over 91,000 trips taken by users here in the city of Lincoln with over 25,000 unique users. Um, and we, I do wanna know at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we, we briefly mentioned uh, the need for data capability and data analysis. And a lot of this was, I was able to keep track of um, you know, ridership and where folks are parking or starting trips, um, seeing usership behavior essentially um, through a third party mobility manager that we in the city opted to use called Populous. Um, it was through this that again, we were able to do high level data analysis work, but also were able to um, ensure that the scooter companies were following um, the rules and regulations that we specified within our permit agreements. Um, so there was, well, I'll continue with the, with the pilot, sorry there. I forgot I had the slide. Um, we in the city of Lincoln um, recently passed our climate action plan and I knew from an environmental standpoint, it made sense to start 
to look at those components. Um, during the pilot, we had several uh, user surveys that were pushed out to kind of get a sense of what was working from the folks actually using uh, the micromobility um, equipment. Um, one thing that we found uh, that was super encouraging was that 21% of bird and spin users here in the city of Lincoln articulated that their scooter trip actually replaced a, a personal vehicle trip. Um, and that directly has impacts on um, the amount of CO2 emissions that are saved here in the city of Lincoln. Um, so I thought that was something worthwhile. And again, um, that piece, in addition to the high level of ridership, um, were key components in justifying or convincing rather the city that this program was a worthwhile venture um, to have as a permanent um, micromobility program here in the city of Lincoln. Um, and so in March of 2022, uh, City Council formally adopted um, ScooterLink as a permanent program here in the city of Lincoln. And we recently, um, at the fall of last year, started our first year of the permanent program. Some of the key things to note um, with the permanent program, we made it uh, we were intentional about expanding the operating area, recognizing that this is a valid form of transportation, and we want to ensure that it's accessible um, to a wider range of folks that are not exclusively to the downtown area. Uh, we also extended operating areas, recognizing that um, you know some folks may be getting to work in the downtown space or other commercial nodes um, earlier than 7 a.m. or later than 10 p.m. Um, and the big piece that I'll touch on here shortly, uh, wanting to be more intentional about our partnerships between the scooter companies, our bike share program, and StarTran, our public transit program, um, to, to make sure that we complement one another, especially when we're talking about first mile, last mile trips. So now into the what's next and what's coming um, from a planning perspective. Uh, earlier this year, it was announced that the city of Lincoln um, was awarded a raise grant for a little over $23 million. And this is gonna be to construct our multimodal transit center um, that will be located downtown. Um, this is beyond exciting and a great opportunity again to ensure that we really look at it more holistically in the sense of how do we get the surrounding neighborhoods or others to the to the transit center, but not just that, how do we get them and encourage them to go to um, local businesses surrounding the area? Um, and with that, we're, we're making sure to explore the possibilities of integrating micromobility, um, both potentially having bike share stations nearby, or uh, some scooter parking and, and really just exploring the idea of mobility hubs. Um, in addition to all of that, looking at um, other type of bike amenities to kind of promote, uh, again, that first mile, last mile trip to the transit center and away from the transit center. Some of those could be bike racks, lockers, showers, what have you. Um, as I kind of alluded to um, in having more intentional conversations with scooter companies and bike share and public transit, um, we, we really wanna start looking at mobility as a service. Granted, we have just started those conversations here in the city of Lincoln, but one area that I have found really encouraging and a good first step, um, Bird, uh, during the pilot program was actually able to um, incorporate the bike share locations and the stations within the Bird app. So that if I was riding a scooter to UNL campus um, and I parked it, it would also show me where the nearest bike share station was and I could theoretically ride my bike to, to East Campus along the trails and whatnot. Um, so we're really wanting to have a integrated transportation system between bike share, 
scooters uh, in transit um, and really starting to explore the concepts of mobility hubs. And that picture that I show there is kind of the bare bones of what it could be, you know, having designated scooter parking, having a bike share station adjacent to uh, the bus stops and having shelters and adequate lighting and even looking at EV charging and um, transportation network uh, company parking and whatnot, just to, to really incentivize folks or rather encourage folks to, to do those first mile, last mile trips. More broadly from a planning effort component, um, we continue to uh, work on our complete streets initiatives. Um, and part of that is really incentivizing uh, safe, accessible connections to the trails, um, to bus stop stations, to commercial nodes, um, and complementing all of our complete streets efforts. Uh, the city of Lincoln was recently awarded a 400,000 federal, uh, federal grant through the Safe Streets and Roads for All um, for us to start the planning efforts to create the city's first Vision Zero Action Plan. This is a huge step um, and it's really going to be focused on ensuring the safety of the most vulnerable road users, those being pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and with that comes ensuring that we make it more accessible and safe and accommodating for micromobility users, for transit users. Um, so that will be a huge component of that. Um, the picture on the right there, um, that aerial that you see there, that was actually a quick build project done through our Safe, safe Routes to School program. Um, where we have that PED signal there um, that leads directly to school. And we knew that there was a transit stop nearby. Um, and there, you, there was, or there is rather, a bike lane north of this location. And at the end of the day, we wanted to do a road diet to shorten the crossing distance for, for kiddos and others, um, as well as providing additional bike infrastructure for those who may use uh, bikes, bike share, scooters uh, to get to and from locations. So we're doing a lot of exciting stuff on that end. And then I'll, I'll finish it off with uh, our transit development plan and our climate action plan um, in that we specify continuing to explore and enhance our um, on-demand services, both from a micro transit and a micro mobility standpoint, as well as uh, prioritizing and promoting um, those first mile, last mile trips and, and essentially getting at how do we make a neighborhood more livable and more accessible for all and safe um, first and foremost. So I said a lot, um, but a lot of exciting stuff happening here in the city of Lincoln and, and uh, I want to just say thank you for the opportunity and uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Roberto. We'll be taking some questions now. So the first question that we had was from Robert Evans. And it was, I live in Southeast Pennsylvania. I live in West Grove, Pennsylvania, Chester County. We only have Rover. And when I call Rover, they say to me that they, he lives um, too far out. How would he be able to address that question? I guess, Nellie, this is Tim. I, I'd encourage you to contact your County Human Services Department if, if, uh, if you have service needs that can't be met with the current providers just to see what other options might be out there from a uh, County Human Service perspective. Thanks, Tim. Another question was, um, 
is there any door to door through door service? And I believe this one was for you, Roberto, and or Tim. Tim, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I'll just mention, we, we do not provide door through door service. Our countywide paratransit service is door to door. Um, so most operations, you're either curb to curb or door to door. Uh, we do not provide any door through door services on any any of our any of our mobility options. Yeah, that's exactly the same over here in the city of Lincoln. May I ask why? I think from from our standpoint, uh, it's, it's more of a liability issue of entering. Like we will enter the threshold of uh, common facilities, whether it's an apartment building uh, or a medical center but we will not cross that threshold into a private residence. Uh, from, it's from a, a liability standpoint, safety standpoint, and uh, just the general operating uh, procedures that we have. Thank you. We had a question about funding. What are your funding sources for van link, bike link, and scooter link, Roberto? Sure. Um, so, I can speak to the scooter link and the bike link pieces. Um, for our bike link program, uh, the equipment itself was funded through that CMAC grant. Um, and that was for all of our equipment. From the operation and maintenance standpoint, that is funded through the city's general fund uh, and is also funded through any ride revenue as well as sponsorships that we acquire. Um, and then on the scooter link front, uh, there's really not a lot of cost associated with that um, aside from just my um, my time on the program supervising the program. Um, so I guess just staff time there. Uh, I will say that we do have a permit fee um, that we uh, ask any interested party that wants to operate here in the city of Lincoln. That one is $10,000. And then the only other fee that we um, impose on a scooter company is uh, a 20 cent uh, per ride fee. So for every trip taken, we take in uh, 20 cents of that. Um, but we felt, at least in this first year of the permanent program, we, we don't want to over complicate um, our fee structure or make it too burdensome on scooter operators and discourage them from wanting to even operate in the city of Lincoln. Uh, thank you for that answer. We had a question that said, in my city, shared scooters and shared bikes have been a problem for our citizens with disabilities because these devices get parked on sidewalks, curb cuts, crosswalks, and et cetera. What do you do to keep these devices off such rights of ways? I, I can start with that one. Um, so with our bike share program, it's fully docked. So um, they have right of way allocated to them where they should be parked. Um, if I was a user on a bike share bike uh, and I didn't want to dock my bike just yet. Um, more often than not, we have a plethora of bike racks scattered throughout town where um, we would make sure to have those parked. Um, I will say more often than not though, it, it really is a station to station type thing and not necessarily um, parking it and leaving it unintended for a while. Um, on the scooter side of the house, um, we are pretty proactive in that we have a, um, a service called uh, Uplink where any community member can text, email, call, um, and I immediately get pinged on those. And um, from there, I'm able to just reach out directly to my point of contact for 
uh, the scooter companies that operate here and make sure to have those issues addressed in a timely manner. Within our permit, we also uh, specifically say that um, scooters need to be rebalanced. And um, if a scooter's at a location for more than 48 hours, it needs to be moved or else it could be impounded by the city. Um, and there's a lot of educational uh, messaging that goes on as well, both from the city end and the scooter operators kind of reminding users you know, to be considerate and ensuring that we leave four feet of, of pedestrian uh, walking space for folks. Um, and we host uh, educational safety events to kind of further connect with the community and, and remind potential users and existing users of the operating and parking rules. Um, the last piece I'll touch on, although the scooter program is dockless in nature, we have started to implement designated scooter parking locations. Uh, that has shown to be um, very helpful, especially in more congested areas um, like our downtown space um, and encouraging users to park and encouraging the scooter companies to deploy their scooters in these locations has been um, very beneficial from, from our end. And from, from a rural perspective with our bike share service, uh, we are a dockless system, but we, we geofence within the city of Meadville, the places where bikes can be rented and returned. So if somebody were to rent a bike at our office here in Meadville and say they wanted to just leave it uh, two blocks away at the supermarket, uh, when they try to end their rental, they'll be told that it is out of zone that the closest docking or closest location to return the bike is X. And if you leave the bike here, you incur a $10 penalty. So that really discourages somebody from just leaving a bike, you know, somewhere where it's not supposed to be. So, you know, we have full control over how we can geofence our, our locations. And in the two years that we've operated this, we've had maybe a handful of times where a bike was left where, where it shouldn't have been. Yeah, that's, 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 that's great. And so again, yeah, the, I'd maybe just add to that sort of the, the education and outreach that occurs with both the the riders and also just the the public too to kind of understand what is you know what kind of impediments this truly can cause and, and create for people um, and so that you know there's uh, Seattle has some some great examples and they've shot some really interesting informational videos and and uh, so kind of looking to coupling the enforcement with that education outreach, I think is, is important. And then I think Chaz had followed up that, um, I should add that our disability community is asking the city leadership to renegotiate the contract with the private company doing it here. We're putting it back out for the RFP. So if you have any best practices for just that component of doing the procurement, please let me know. Uh, Nelly, there was a question that came up in the chat about theft bikes and scooters. So uh, from our perspective, um, we have not lost any of our bikes in our service, even though we have a dockless system, a rear tire locking system. Um, we have had a few bikes go missing for a few weeks, but uh, they were found. Uh, we, we built a relationship with the city police here that if they see a bike somewhere laying around, you know, let us know. Uh, we actually had one bike here in Meadville go missing for a few weeks and it ended up uh, one of our bus drivers in Venango County, 30 miles away, saw it, uh, you know, in downtown Oil City. So no idea how it got there, but we were able to retrieve those bikes. So even though we have a dockless system and the bike's not, not physically locked to a station, we have not had any issues with, uh, with theft. A little bit of van, we had one bike get vandalized, but other than that, uh, very, the, the community has been very respectful of the service. Yeah, similar uh, here in the city of Lincoln. Um, we've had some bikes go missing for a little bit or some uh, 
deciding to go for a long distance bike ride uh, to go outside of city limits, but um, nothing crazy on that end. People have been very kind and, and good about interacting with our, our bike share program. And on the scooter front, or I guess for both uh, micro mobility programs, they're GPS enabled. So we're able to see uh, where those scooters and bikes are at. Um, so we haven't really run into any of those type of issues, fortunately. We have another question. Have you all seen an overall shift in the use of public transportation overall with the added micro mobility and micro transit? I'll say I'll start from from our perspective. We you know we don't have the actual data to back that up, but what we started to see last year were some trends in bike share where we had individuals doing one way rentals. Now, most people, when they rent a bike, they would ride from a recreational standpoint, ride around town or ride the trail and return the bike to the same location. But we started seeing definitive patterns once we put bikes up at Allegheny College where bikes were being rented at the college campus and coming down the hill about, you know, almost a mile into Meadville, parked at the Market House location, which is adjacent to our primary bus stop location in the city of Meadville, and those bikes were just one-way trips. We also started seeing that pattern out near Ernst Trail, where there's a Home Depot and a supermarket. People were renting bikes at Ernst Trail and returning them in the core of downtown Meadville, which leads us to believe that they were they were using other modes to, to finish their trip or, or the return trip, whether that was by transit or uh, some other means. But I do think you know, we have, without having the concrete data, we are starting to see that pattern of one-way trips with trips on the bikes ending adjacent to our transfer, transfer points. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, Tim, thank you for that. We had a couple operational questions um, and reporting questions, such as explain how reporting microtransit passenger trips differs from paratransit demand, demand response reporting in NTD. I think we're, we're a little too early in that process right now because we're, you know, we're hoping to launch our microtransit platform here in July 1st, mm -hmm. and we're actively working with PennDOT right now to get the necessary approvals for that service. So I, we're not a, a place where we can answer that question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I can reach out to my contacts within StarTrain and, and get a response and send that to the group. No, um, and then we had a couple driver related questions. Um, one was explain whether the ability to hire someone with a chauffeur's license to drive smaller micro transit vehicles has facilitated the recruitment of bus operators. And a follow up to that is please give an example of how micro transit has increased the number of applicants who have applied to work as drivers. Uh, yeah, from a micro transit perspective, again, we're a little too early to answer that question. I will say from a paratransit perspective, you know, we have had success bringing in non-CDL drivers into some of our accessible minivans into paratransit and then helping them get their CDLs and their air brake endorsements to become drivers in the mass transit program. So we've seen some success there. Uh, could we, we can bring in somebody that maybe doesn't have uh, all that much driving experience, but they have excellent customer service skills, or they're just a great people person, and we can train them to be a CDL driver. So we have had success with that and have been, uh, had, had good success and mostly success with hiring individuals and promoting them up from non-CDL up to the necessary classifications to drive the whole way up to a, uh, you know, a mass transit vehicle. Yeah, the recruitment of drivers has been, um, a challenge for us here in the city of Lincoln, but we have um, gone on a pretty lucrative hiring campaign um, as of late to kind of recruit StarTran drivers. And um, the last recruitment effort was well attended and we were able to secure, I think like 10 or so uh, drivers that 
day. So um, that's an area that we're still hoping to, to expand upon and, and get better at. Sounds great. Any other questions? Please speak now. Nellie, I don't see any other questions. Well, we'd like to thank our guests um, today and all of the FTA technical assistance centers that have participated in these microtransit versus micromobility webinar series. Um, we'd like to also thank Ken Thompson, uh, who has helped facilitate these um, series. He is retiring from NADTC and the Easter Seals after 22 years of working in the transportation industry. But Ken, Thank you so much for joining us and we will miss you. And so please take our survey and let us know how we've done. We will post the recordings and the presentations on the National RTOP website. Nelly, can you drop the survey link in the chat? We have a request. And, there it is. Yep, the survey link is in chat, and the link should pop up once the webinar is over. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.